Speech is one last rant. <laughs> Our speaker is returning from a visit to Schenectady. Schenectady, New York, where he visited his niece's family. The adults were nice enough, but the stars of the visit were her three kids. The eight and five year old boys considered him their hero in almost the almost two-year-old girl can almost say his name. Oh. Please welcome Al Huggins. How should we do this? Well, there is a piece missing from what the introduction was to include a reference that the speech will be the summary of an article that was in the paper and on television over the weekend. It was, it's a summary of the Washington Post 60 minute story about the DEA being, boy I want to use the language, DEA having its legs cut out from underneath them. I was going to say something different but that's, so when I heard that story I was absolutely apoplectic. It was anything but, I had anything but equanimity. I was so mad I could spit. The story affected me particularly because I was, had given a speech here about the opioid epidemic that we are in, and in that speech I celebrated the fact that we, at least this time, our drug crisis was, a, the victims of the drug crisis were acknowledged to be having a problem, a drug problem, and were patients as opposed to criminals as they were considered in the drug epidemic of, in the mid-90s. I did note that in the 90s, they, the drug users were considered to be criminals and were mostly black and brown. This time it is notable that most of the population that is suffering from opioid abuse is mostly white. Point being, the main point being that drug users are considered to be patients and in needing of treatment. That was my speech in July. Today I'd like to talk about the pushers of drugs, at least some of the pushers of drugs. Now, the, the, the drug pushers that I'm talking about today are not street gangs, they're not drug cartels. Well, actually, they are drug cartels. Mm. And they're also Fortune 500 companies. This article that was on 60 Minutes and on and published as, in the Washington Post and republished in the Star Tribune, Drug Industry Triumphs Over DEA. It, the story focuses primarily on drug distributors, not so much on the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the drugs like Johnson and Johnson and uh, per, Purdue Pharma but the companies that distribute them. There are three who, are, who manage about 85% of the drug distribution in the country. They are Cardinal Health, Amerisaurus Bergen, and McKesson. And they were abetted by their lobbying arm, the Healthcare Distribution Alliance. Now recall that over 200,000 Americans have been killed in this recent, have died in this recent drug epidemic, compare that to the 58,000 Americans who died in the war in Vietnam, more than three times as many. So what happened? How did they do this? It, it was a law that was signed into, it was a bill that was signed into law in April of last year, 2016. It has the usual bland, nondescriptive na name that uh, Washington laws have. It is the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2016. This was the culmination of a long campaign to, by the drug industry to harm and, and, and to reduce the efforts of the DEA to limit the distribution of opioids to rogue pharmacies and doctors who will supply the black market in opio opiates. Now, how did they do this? The, the blade of the knife that cut the legs 
out of, from under the DEA, was a couple of sentences. They changed the standard by which the DEA, uh, the standard that by which the DEA could bring a case. The old law said that the DEA had to establish that there was imminent danger to the community before they could take an action to limit the distribution of too many opiates. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but danger, imminent danger to the community was apparently is a broad enough standard that the DEA was able to effectively stop the distribution of black market drugs. The new standard, the, under this new law is that they must establish that there is a substantial likelihood of immediate threat. Now, picture that the, a, a man about to stab someone and you can't stop him until his arm is actually going forward. This immediate threat criteria is an impossibly high bar to meet. The DEA effectively is impotent in the face of this new standard. Now, how did this happen? Regular run-of-the-mill Washington practice, two in particular. The revolving door, uh, where workers from an agency go to work in the industry that they used to oversee, happened in the DEA. Uh, lawyers, in this case, were had, who had written, written the laws and helped the DEA enforce, the, enforce those laws, go to work for the drug industry and knowing the inner workings of the DEA and how they, they are particularly skilled and able to thwart the DEA. The worst offender here is a man named D. Lyndon Barber who wrote the laws, then in 2011 he went to work in the drug industry and he wrote this law that, de that decapitates the DEA. The other standard run-of-the-mill run practice in, in D.C. is to fund campaigns of different legislators. A few million dollars went into the coffers of a few legislators, and two in particular were mentioned in the article, uh, Tom Marino and Orrin Hatch, one senator and one uh, congressman in the reverse order. Tom Marino was the shepherd of this law through the through, through Congress and was the leader of it. Now, the one last thing that's kind of that's really quite important is that this law was passed via unanimous consent, a vehicle through the Congress that allows non-controversial laws or bills to become law, and this law was done by that because most people weren't aware of it, including the administration that I am rather fond of, the Obama administration. Uh, they didn't see this coming, signed off on it without really understanding what it was. Mr. Marino, the shepherd of this bill, was to become the drug czar. And after this story was published, on Monday, he withdrew his name Thank goodness, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Hal. Uh, 